talked about the Perseverance launch, the instruments aboard. We've talked about infrared astronomy. And all of this kind of suggests that all that NASA does is look outward. And I think it's really important that we focus on the fact that actually much of NASA's research uh, is looking down, is looking upon our Earth, our, our home, that we need to protect, that we need to understand, and yet is still actually a, quite a mystery. Um, with all of the science that we've done and, and all this popular exploration of, you know, living on Mars and going out so far and all this, really the, there are enough mysteries for us here at home to explore. Um, we have a, a great guest today who's going to uh, talk to us a little bit about this, a, a close personal friend uh, and uh, someone who that really opened up a lot of uh, opportunities for me to understand this better as we actually went on a, an expedition uh, with the Ocean Exploration Trust aboard the EV Nautilus. And this gave me an opportunity to see what I think is critical for, for kids to understand these days as they explore uh, careers in science, which is that when you have a job in science, uh, first of all, you have no clue what you're getting into, right? The, uh, any, any class you take in school uh, really only scratches the surface of the kind of jobs that are out there. But second of all, uh, no one scientist works alone. Uh, and that's, that's really what I took away from uh, uh, working on the Nautilus for that short time was that all of a sudden all these geologists and oceanographers and chemists and engineers all came together to do some pretty amazing things. So we're, we're very, very lucky today to have Megan Cook, uh, who is going to talk to us about uh, the, the research that the Nautilus does, both uh, it, you know, kind of aligned to some of the things that, that we've done in the past with NASA and over the uh, broader kind of um, scope of understanding our oceans. So without any delay, let me tell you uh, quick, we're going to uh, hear a little talk from Megan. We'll do some Q&A and then we'll finish off with some education resources from both the OET and from uh, the JPL education teams to um, help you guys kind of push this further. If these are things that you enjoyed and you have kids at home or students who really want to explore this, we have some resources for you. In fact, we'll even follow up on a Saturday session just for teachers that will, uh, again, feature Megan coming back for a second time. And we'll be able to, again, just look a, a little bit deeper in, in terms of what we can offer students and teachers in this space. But first, let's uh, uh, you know pull the curtain back for the wonderful Megan Cook. Please take it away and tell us uh, a little bit about uh, uh, the Ocean Exploration Trust. Thank you so much, Brandon. I am so excited to be here and to get to share some with you today. I'm Megan Cook. Um, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm connected with you here today from Friday Harbor in the state of Washington. Uh, this is the ancestral and modern homelands of the Coast Salish people, including the Souk, Samish, Saanich, Semiamu, Songhee, and Lummi nations, and they have I thank them for stewarding this wonderful place surrounded by a beautiful ocean. And that's what we get to talk about today is the ocean and this blue salty planet that we all share. Um, I'm so excited to bring the topic a little back closer to home, a little closer to the blue backyard for everyone to talk about oceans today. Um, there are fascinating discoveries being made to the extents of the known universe. Uh, and there are fascinating discoveries being made right here. Um, basic discoveries, basic understanding of the things that we have right here on the planet. And I'm really happy to be able to share that with you. Um, in our community, we sometimes call this the exploration of inner space instead of outer space. And so um, I feel really honored and really special to get to share some of that um, on an official NASA program like this. So um, some basics. Our oceans are super essential to life on this planet. If this is new to you, I'm happy to share that the ocean has been making 50% of the oxygen that uh, we all love to breathe. It regulates our climate and our water cycle. Um, the oceans provide protein for billions of people. They transport 90% of the things that you own. So if you've never been on a journey across the ocean, many of the things in your house probably have. Um, so they're essential to our transportation and infrastructure. Um, they're full of potential of, of things like biopharmaceuticals where we can learn from nature, incredible novel things. Uh, and they're a source of meaning and mystery in art and in culture. 
And it's some of that mystery that I want to dive into today and what my team gets to help reveal. Um, for all that we do know about the ocean, all these fundamental things, there's a lot that we don't know. And there are some big numbers that still blow my mind every time I hear them, that the ocean is 95-ish percent unexplored, and the ocean is 80 percent not mapped. It is only 20 percent mapped at modern resolution. I'm going to talk a little bit about the technologies and tools and how we're chipping away at those numbers and how you can be part of chipping away at those numbers too. Um, and I'm really proud to be part of the team at Ocean Exploration Trust. I'm the manager of education partnerships and programs for this nonprofit. And um, I've been part of the team for eight years. Since I'm the one giving the talk, I get to pick out some of my favorite moments of discovery to share with you, to introduce you to the things that we've seen along the way. There are way too many, you know, an embarrassment of riches to choose among all of them. So I hope I'll give you a few more and spark your curiosity to go and explore some others as well. So we're going to kick it off with slide number one, and this is our spaceship. Ocean Exploration Trust owns and operates um, exploration vessel Nautilus. She's a 211 foot long research vessel. And this ship travels around the world supporting our mission to do three things. The first one is explore go places we have not seen before on planet Earth. The second part of the mission is to innovate and develop and test technologies. The parts of the ocean that are unexplored are not generally the parts where you can put on a mask and fins and snorkel and jump into the ocean and check them out. They are the parts of the ocean that are deep and dark and far from shore. And uh, those are places where we get to test out really interesting technology suites to crack those codes, solve those problems. And the third part of our mission that is nearest and dearest, certainly to my heart, is to inspire with these expeditions, to share them with the world, and to invite another generation of explorers to be part of them. We do that by broadcasting 24 hours a day, seven days a week from the deep sea, to invite you into the process of exploration, uh, to demystify that somewhere. And, um, to let you know, the ship is at sea right now. We are doing a little bit of every STEM professional's favorite task right now, which is troubleshooting. So hopefully we'll have the chance to chat with a member of the team a little bit later. But if not, you can tune in to Nautilus Live and see this ship out exploring the ocean right now. Um, on slide number two, I get to talk with you today. It is my total pleasure, but I would be remiss to not acknowledge and first highlight the incredible team that does this work. We call our team the core of exploration. They are not only scientists, but engineers, technology specialists, data managers, media specialists, educators, students, professional mariners, and runs the gamut. There are 1,200 professionals who have sailed in our core of exploration over the 10 years that we've uh, been on this mission. and. I think this is one of the most exciting things for students, as Brandon mentioned. When I was a kid growing up, I grew up in the desert, the ocean lived only in storybooks, and I thought being a marine biologist was the only thing that meant you could work in the ocean. And now I get to spend my job, my whole career, telling people how many other things they could do that could still end up taking them to these places. Um, let's jump into that exploration. Uh, slide three, let's talk about where we want to go explore. The ship has moved all over the world. Um, in the time that we have been an organization the last uh, dozen or so years. But we just received a new federal award through the Cooperative Institute system to work with partners to explore and characterize America's oceans. This is the 50% of America that is underwater. Uh, every nation has sort of a, a, you can imagine it like a donut around your shore. It is an exclusive economic zone, a buffer of 200 nautical miles, and that is part of the country um, that shares that maritime border. So America has 3.4-ish million square miles of ocean, and that is uh, half of the total territory that is America. And we have basic questions. What is there? Who lives there? What kind of habitats do we have? What kind of history? Our, uh, shipwrecks, maritime heritage is there, and we're on this mission to go and explore that. Um, in slide four, our model of exploration really centers around telepresence, which is a suite of transmission technologies. It's the same way I'm talking to you right now, but it lets students FaceTime with a robot at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, it takes a data signal from the remotely operated vehicles on the seafloor, not only just up to the ship, but out through a satellite feed and to ground stations out through the internet to anyone who wants to be there at the moment of discovery. Uh, if you have seen, you know, if you can kind of imagine some parallels here to the space sphere, we certainly can think about 
um, a shoreside support team, an operational team, whether they are in orbit or out at sea, and then a robotic end effector like a vehicle. Uh, we're really proud to have been able to use this technology not only to explore the oceans, but also to work with NASA. We got to work with the SUBC, love a good acronym, the Systematic Underwater Biogeochemical Science and Exploration Analog, SUBC, team um, from NASA Ames to collaborate on a study where looking at these different parts and introducing latency in the gaps in between each of those different segments, how do you have, help a team be effective in your exploration mission? How can you work together and uh, break down some of the barriers that, you know, now that we live in a digital world and anybody's lagging on an internet call, you know how much that latency can be frustrating, certainly when we want to um, explore an ocean or explore a solar system. We want to work around those problems first. So really happy to see our first parallel there with space. In slide five, I want to give you a quick intro to seafloor mapping. It's very difficult to know much about the ocean or to ask a good scientific question about the ocean if you don't have a map, if you don't even know where we're starting. So the first part of our exploration mode is to map the seafloor. We use a multi-beam map, which you uh, a multi-beam echo sounder, which is uh, an acoustic tool. You can think about this like shouting at the seafloor and waiting for the echo to come back and revealing the landscapes along the way. Uh, on slide six, I want to introduce you to some of the shapes of the seafloor. If you've never considered before that all of the rough and uh, rugged parts of the dry, dusty parts of Earth, mountains, valleys, open plains, uh, are underwater, let me introduce that topic to you. The Earth is just as varied in the salty parts beneath the ocean. The world's largest mountain range wraps around the Earth like the seams on a baseball. And uh, we see all of those same features, uh, valleys, hills, open plains, deep trenches in the ocean. And a mapping system like this reveals it. I often ask with students, between the blurry part that you can see on the left, and that is a satellite approximation, that's an unmapped segment of the seafloor, versus that richly colored, that is a false color scale, that rainbow colored seafloor there where you start to see all those different shapes and different features, I could ask a lot more interesting scientific questions based on the part that's in detail there. And it would lead me um, to be much more curious about what's happening there on the seafloor. The second part of our exploration suite of tools and technologies though uh, is on slide number seven and that is our team of remotely operated vehicles. I always laugh that this photo looks a little like they're going to drop an album but these are our 4,000 and 6,000 meter rated vehicles um, which are they all have names and they have names from class classical mythology for any of those English language art educators out there. Um, these are Hercules and Argus uh, Atalanta and Little Hercules because we need a little more creativity. Uh, on slide eight though, I want to introduce you to Hercules. This is the typical vehicle, the remotely operated vehicle. You can think about this like robots on leashes um, down on the seafloor. Um, they are connected to the ship at all times and they send a, us back data from a suite of different types of tools and cameras that we can put on or take off depending on the needs of that mission. So we have things that can like two manipulator arms, collect physical samples from the seafloor. We can collect water samples, profile the water, collect um, gases or minerals out of concentration, uh, all kinds of different types of tools that allow us to explore these different sites. All right, that's enough of like the, the nuts and the bolts of how we do this. Let's talk about some of the cool things that we get to see. Um, on slide nine, I want to introduce you to uh, one of our, I guess our, our discoveries often fall into sort of these very broad categories that with sort of these artificial boundaries in between, right? We think about geology and then we think about that being different from biology or chemistry. Everything I'm gonna show you is a mix of everything, but if we're gonna call it arbitrary boundaries, let's talk geology. Uh, what you're looking at is a hydrothermal vent chimney. This is a place where the skin of the planet pulls apart at a tectonic boundary. Water from uh, the water column seeps down into the rocks and cracks, is heated by the magma chamber underneath, dissolves rocks and minerals along the way, and the superheated water comes rising and shooting back out as that black smoke or as a plume um, rising out of the seafloor. I am trained as an ecologist. I am a biologist at heart, and the first time I dove on a hydrothermal vent, I about lost my mind. These are as big as like seven or 10-story buildings. Um, they are 
hundreds and hundreds of degrees and it's just spectacular. If I was gonna pick a superpower, I think I would wanna fly. It would be the one I would pick and maneuvering a remotely operated vehicle through a scene of chimneys like this um, is as close, I think, as that like flying experience I will probably ever get. What's spectacular about these, besides the fact that they're um, these mineral rich, copper, gold, zinc, silver, um, rich uh, landscapes underwater and their sheer scale is that there's life there. Um, this is the site we first discovered chemosynthetic life, chemosynthetic being that uh, foil to photosynthetic, chemosynthetic meaning rather than using sunlight to make energy, you are going to use chemicals and transform that in a chemical process into sugars, um, life there on the seafloor. Slide 10, um, we really opened up our understanding by discovering hydrothermal vents that there were different methods to ways to make a living in this universe. And we've now, uh, this is, thank you NASA, an image from um, Saturn's moon Enceladus, where we, it is very likely that we have hydrothermal activity on beneath the ice-encrusted oceans. So these lessons that we're learning here about our own planet um, are kind of widening the perspective of ways that we can look for life and we can look for these different types of planetary processes outside of our own planet, which is really, really exciting. Um, so there's a lot of crossover between the ocean and space science communities uh, looking at ocean planets beyond our own. For number slide 11, I want to introduce you to another of my favorite chemosynthetic environments because I, I never knew I was going to have favorite chemosynthetic environments until I had the chance to work with this team. This is a brine pool. There are lakes underneath the ocean, y'all. This is a hypersaline, so regular salt water, again, gets down into the cracks in the seafloor sediments. Uh, into salt domes, which are created by plate tectonics and changing uh, ocean depths over time, um, and dissolve some of that super that salt concentration into super saline brine and can get captured in depressions and domes, um, spots in the seafloor, and form these lakes, which are um, hot spots of biodiversity and an incredible place to look for extremophiles that make a living in these very, very tough conditions of not only high pressure, extreme cold, but add hypersaline into the mix. And you get some really interesting life like the mussel and clam beds. You can see some different sea cucumbers, crabs, as fish communities all living vibrantly down here on the seafloor. If we want to pr pretend biology hasn't been present yet, let's talk about some more biology of the seafloor. On slide 12, I want to introduce you to some uh, deep sea corals. This is a aridogorgia or a spiral coral. It is over six feet tall. It is more than a megan tall. And um, these are individual colonies. So you are looking at an animal. Um, you are also looking at an animal that is like the trees of a forest, the creator of habitat complexity on the seafloor. There are incredible coral communities all throughout the deep sea. Um, not typically the reef forming ones that we'd often think about from a tropical vacation or, or a planet Earth special, but these highly dynamic and incredibly old species. The deep sea is a place where a lot of metabolism moves very slowly. And there are coral colonies. This one is likely over a thousand years old. There are corals in the deep sea that are over 4,000 years old. And if you want to think about that, like what was happening on Earth uh, 4,000 years ago? Humans invented glass. We found out how to make glass. So an individual animal is older than glass. And, you know, the Babylonians invented a base 60 math system 4,000 years ago and divided a circle into 360 parts for the first time. So, like, that individual organism is older than math, which is pretty startling um, to tell students. And then I just wanted to share that one of the things I love the most about exploring the deep sea is um, we're constantly being surprised. You know, uh, I, you can never let your guard down. It doesn't matter when in the expedition it is, the next thing right around the corner might be the last thing that you ever expected. And on slide 13, I want to show you one of those moments where I, after eight years of this, got caught completely off guard. This was the last expedition of the year, last year. It was the last few hours of the dive, and we were on our way across a sedimented basin, trying to get over to some other rocks to take a look. 
And there was a sonar target off in the distance that um, we thought was likely a pile of rocks. And as we advanced upon it, it was certainly not a pile of rocks. Um, this was a whale fall, absolutely covered with life. A whale fall is um, kind of a made up word, I guess, but you can put the parts together. It is when a whale dies and sinks or falls to the seafloor and the dinner bell goes off all across the seafloor community and in come all these different kinds of life. And scavenging this carcass on the seafloor um, were amphipods, eel pouts, um, um, the most metal, bizarre, amazing creature, which is a, a bone-eating worm. Ocidax is the genus of worms, and they amazing to think about a community ecology. How do they find these whale falls and hop from one to the next across the deep sea environment? Um, but they eat uh, and digest the calcium of bones, and that's what you can see. Another chemosynthetic community there living in the sediment off of the plumes. Um, we had no plans to study a whale fall during this expedition. In fact, we just wanted to go over to the rocks and we thought we would be like headed back to port. So um, every, you know, you hit the proverbial breaks at these moments. And what the system of telepresence allows us to do is call up the experts. Who do we need to see this discovery right now? Whose expertise could help us better understand this? And how can we contribute more to the science community than just looking around at one another of whoever was on board at that moment and being like, I don't know, Brandon, what do you know about? Uh, whales and what type this might be. So it's an, um, kind of an acceleration and also a flattening of the process of science that we're able to include more people at this moment. This was a big discovery. There are whale falls that have been found when they're in a highly digested state. There are a few whale falls that have been intentionally sunk um, to study their progression over time. But just finding one like this in the moment really inspired a lot of scientists. So we wanted to come back and see that. I'm going to take you to slide 14. We went back just a few weeks ago and returned to the whale fall a year later to see what was there. There was a lot less there, <laughs> spoiler alert. Um, you know, so as we looked at that, there was a, a community really succession there. There were different types of worms and different types of microbes on the seafloor. Um, none of the larger scavengers were still there. Well, one rat tail fish that we're not totally sure if we just caught him on the flyby or if he or she um, were hanging out there. Um, but you get to see just these like very surprise moments that there's now a time sequence for this spe this particular site in the deep sea. And these are these basic ca catch you off guard, never know what's around the corner next kinds of moments that um, a ship of our kind has. Uh, this year has been a really different year for us. Um, on slide 15, I want to show you some of the sites where we've been this year. Um, it, we've changed a lot about our program, but I'm incredibly proud of our team for finding a way to make a safe operation season this year. We have asked people to go to sea for longer. We've extended the duration. We quarantined and tested the entire team, and they're all aboard wearing masks to make it possible to be out there. We transferred a lot of our science effort through telepresence to involve people leading expeditions and leading dives and sampling from shore through the internet. Um, but all, you know, an amazing gratitude to the team who are out at sea right now. And I wanna bring in part of our team right now. I can see that one of our seafloor mapping specialists and watch leaders, um, Aaron Heffron is here with us live aboard EV Nautilus to give us an update about what the ship is up to right now. Hi, Aaron, can you hear us? I can hear you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. No. Yes. Hey. Yeah. Great. Um, I'm alone in here, so I'm actually going to lower my mask if that's okay. Um, I'm alone in the studio and the door's shut. But hello, everybody. So I am out on the ship right now, and we're in the middle of a mapping expedition. Um, we're about 150 nautical miles off the coast of California, and we're doing some mapping um, at the edge of the United States exclusive economic zone. So that's what we're working on right now. You want me to tell you more about the expedition, Megan? I would love that. And maybe you could tell us a little bit more about um, mapping in general. Erin is one of our team leads for that effort and maybe why you love mapping, why you think it's important. Sure. So um, we do map with a multi-beam sonar. We have a Konsberg EM302, which is a 30 kilohertz multi-beam sonar. 
Um, that's a good sonar for reaching almost the deepest depths of the ocean, which is where we tend to be. We're a deep water, typically a deep water exploration vessel. So it fits our needs of being able to map between 200 and about 5,000 meters depth. Um, the sonar sends an acoustic pulse to the seafloor and that returns. And from the time difference of sending that pulse and coming back, we know the depth of the seafloor. We also get information, um, the intensity of the return pulse tells us information about the seafloor as well. Um, gives us some idea of what its character is. Is it soft or hard? Um, so it could help us pick out rocks and, and things like that. And we also are able to take samples of the water column with the acoustics. So any targets between us and the seafloor that the acoustics run into are also recorded by our system. So we can use that information um, to track, um, often we're tracking bubbles in the water column if we're looking for gas escaping from the seafloor. Um, but anything with a bubble in it, so that includes uh, whales with big air pockets, their lungs, or fish with their swim bladders, they also will reflect acoustic energy and we can see them when they pass underneath our sonar. Um, I am trained as a mapper, so I did a master's degree in seafloor mapping. Um, I, my background when I was an undergraduate was geology. And I love mapping because uh, unlike mapping topography, this is probably the only view we're ever going to get. We send the ROVs down and we can see pieces of the seafloor and we can kind of compare that to what we see in the sonar, but we'll never get that full landscape picture like we do with the sonar. And I just find that incredibly exciting. Um, so today, for example, we were coming onto site um, coming over an area that had not been mapped before and went over not one, but two beautiful uh, guillotes on the seafloor, these beautiful flat topped features that were not even, there's no indication of them in the existing um, estimates of what the seafloor looked like. So we have surprises at every turn. Uh, it's really, really fun and exciting. Um, and we just set up um, a bunch of mapping to do and we're probably gonna be in this area for at least six days in this one specific area. Mapping takes time and we cover big areas, but it does take a couple days. So we'll be out here, we'll be mapping the north. You can see behind me um, some of the mapping data on one of the screens. Um, you can see some nice rocky topography back there. Um, yeah, we're just really looking forward to, to seeing what we'll see underneath the water. That's so exciting. Erin, I want to make sure we have a ton of time to answer questions from the audience, but I want to ask first one because I'm like that. Um, I Can you talk to us a little bit about like, you mentioned it takes time. How much time would it take to like map all of the USC easy? Like I showed that, that donut around America. Like how much time are we talking to get that much work done? Oh my gosh, I wish I had a better estimate. It would, it's taking us maybe six days to map something that's, oh my gosh, 100 nautical miles wide by maybe 50 nautical miles. So that's one ship, 24 hour, hour operations to map. Yeah, it's pretty solid square, <laughs> but when you zoom out, it's really not that much. So it's it's an extensive undertaking for us to map the whole easy and not just us, the other ships that are also contributing to that effort. Um, so the push to map the easy was part of um, something we've been doing for the whole time I've been on Nautilus with a sonar, but there's been a recent push um, with an organization called Seabed 2030. Um, and the idea and the hope is that we will map all of the ocean floor by 2030. And just a starting point for the US is to map our own EEZ. We've also been mapping in the Pacific on the Nautilus and in um, international waters, but now there's this concentrated effort. It's like, yeah, we should map all of that, but my gosh, we should definitely map what is our exclusive economic zone first. So I wish I had better numbers. All I can say is a long time again. <laughs> it take a long time um, and many ships, but people are motivated and we have, uh, our ship is contributing. The UNOL's scientific fleet is contributing. Um, NOAA vessels are contributing. So everybody has a push to get their data in, make it available, um, and so that we get this kind of continuous uh, seafloor model. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, Brandon, let's throw it back to you. Aaron and I are both really excited to answer any questions that have come in. Fantastic. Yeah, I thank you so much. I mean, it's just so exciting. The my heart is so full hearing chemosynthesis so many times in a talk. That makes me very, very happy. Um, and and again, I, I just I think it can't be emphasized enough the, the this union of expertise, both um, uh, from from one field and from many fields coming together is, is 
really the only way this kind of research can get done. Um, so lots of lots of good questions. Um, actually, one one that I thought was really interesting right off the bat. Um, what about uh, you know clearly the the ocean is is still that last frontier. Uh, how are we doing on smaller bodies? What about like uh, the Great Lakes and things like that? Have we mapped those at least? That's a really good question, and no, we haven't. We haven't completely mapped our Great Lakes either. Um, and OET and Megan could probably add some in too on this, but we did an expedition last year with uh, Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary on, on one of the Great Lakes. And we were doing some of their mapping, um, not with Nautilus, Nautilus didn't go there, it was a mobile expedition for us. So we um, were using an ASV, an autom autonomous surface vehicle for mapping. And we also, um, NOAA also contributed their vehicle to Storm, which is just a, a smaller mapping launch with a multi-beam sonar. And between our ASB and their launch, we mapped some really big portions, but there's still plenty to be mapped just in that one great lake for that one sanctuary, let alone the, the entirety of the lake. Um, so as with Seabed 2030, that's also put forward a, a motivation. I think they're calling themselves Lakebed 2030, um, that yeah, we should be mapping our Great Lakes as well as such a huge freshwater resource and such an important part of the US. Yeah, I would just add, I, I think that's perfect. I would add that, you know, even charts, and I think a lot of times if students, you know, if you said it wasn't mapped, my first thing, I would pull up my phone and I would look right at that display and I would say like, sure it is, it's right here on my phone. Um, but the point is, is you zoom in and zoom in and zoom into those, you get less and less resolution up to the point where, you know, a single data point might be making an approximation for kilometers, you know, and if you tried to give directions to your house and when you got within a few kilometers, it just stopped and said you were there, I think we would all be pretty frustrated not uh, having the level of detail that we wanted to um, get the information that we needed. And I think in many places in our maps, we're still using either single points like that or even historic points. There are places on the charts of the Arctic that were soundings like put a rock on a rope, throw it over the ship, let it hit the bottom, pull it back, see how far it was from the 1700s. And those are still the modern charts in places. So we really are um, at a time when technology and exploration is highly needed. Yeah, that, that actually gets to another question uh, that was asked. So uh, someone's wondering, you know, what, what is the big restriction? Now, obviously the scale, right? But uh, what are there any kind of technological hurdles or is there kind of a future engineering product for, for the instrumentation to help facilitate this happening? Do you want me to start, Megan? And maybe you can add on? Sure. Take it away. Um, yeah, I mean, it is a limitation. The, the time and resources is a major limitation. Um, there have been technology advances. Um, Multi-beam sonar is honestly fairly recent. Um, 1980s is when it really became available to normal folks. So that's a while now, but recent in the general history of maritime culture. Um, but we've been making improvements in different vehicles that can go to the seafloor. Um, there was just a um, Ocean X Prize to try and force multiply um, the amount of mapping. So people will bring in many, many different mapping platforms to map at the same time. Um, but we are limited by the fact that we have to go through this medium that is water and that it's um, quite deep. <laughs> so from the surface, we can cover so much, but only at a certain resolution. As you get closer to the seafloor, you can get better resolution, but it's a much narrower swath. Acoustics still um, is thought to be the best way of mapping the seafloor. They're doing a little bit with lasers, with light, um, but light does attenuate in water. So acoustics has been kind of the, the, the way forward as far as I know. Um, so that's kind of on our side, I guess, what we see happening is just more vessels coming online, these autonomous surface vessels, autonomous underwater vehicles, bringing in more tools to do the mapping with acoustics. Um, that's what I see the most of. What about you, Megan? I think that's exactly right. Um, part of our uh, five-year cooperative institute program that I mentioned is to work together with other innovative um, centers and universities around the country uh, to really push the technology some. We have great autonomous underwater vehicles. There are great autonomous surface vehicles. Certainly shipboard systems are refined to a point where there is a lot of operational efficiency there. But how can we get better at, at 
adding all the toys up. So next spring, we're going to be um, launching some expeditions where we are looking at multiple AUVs in sequence, um, multiple uh, platforms all at once. And then there's some really interesting, you know, for students interested in computer programming and machine learning, certainly the logic of how you could design a survey and give certain conditions to a tool that says, if you spot this in your cameras, if you see this type of feature, how could we circle back and investigate that? So that um, as we multiply, we're not just multiplying things that can map really efficiently, but maybe we can map and also uh, create some logic and create some um, more selective um, exploration, really uh, intuition, maybe into a machine. That's probably the wrong word, but but to think about how we can start to um, put the incredible talent that our brains have at pattern recognition, um, at noticing when something is different, those those things that give us, you know, kind of the spidey sense clues when you're looking at the seafloor that something might be different and you want to check it out. How can we also build those into our technologies? And, and it's happening now, and those advances are coming along. There will be no generation who has explored more of this planet than the students who are in your classrooms. Forget any, like, if you think about an explorer and you see, like, hat with a raccoon like tail attached to it and like an oil painting of, of a man you know from the oldie days like that's not who the explorers the legendary explorers are going to be they're going to be your students because this technology is advancing so rapidly and we have such urgency to what we need to understand about the planet that's such a, a motivating message and i definitely want to um circle back to some of the programs that you have for students and educators um i, I do want to ask one more tech question i, I saw came up um, which is, uh, you, you kind of mentioned this a little bit, the clearly right now, this, this morning, for example, we dialed into a bunch of, uh, classrooms, uh, talking about the fleet of satellite missions, looking at, uh, our oceans that NASA hosts, uh, you know, we look at things like sea salinity, ocean topography. Um, but you guys are, you guys are down here. You're on the front lines. What's, what's the, uh, the interplay, if any, in between like the satellite data and what you guys are doing kind of underneath the water. Do they help each other? Uh, do you guys kind of work on both ends? Go, Aaron. Uh, well, satellites for us, um, satellite altimetry is the basis for estimates of the seafloor. So yeah, definitely helpful. And that the satellite altimetry um, has has build the gaps to the point where we have some idea um, of what's happening on the seafloor. So definitely an incredibly useful tool and definitely totally worth having. Um, lets us maybe focus our energies on places. Um, we can map one area a little more quickly if we don't anticipate a lot of seafloor change, so you can always be surprised. And spend more time devoting more time to areas with a lot of rugosity and a lot of a lot of features on the seafloor. So on that end, satellites are providing the basis for our mapping data. Um, satellites are also super important in providing us with our positioning. That's how we know where we are, and that's how we know that the map we're making is is right here, as opposed to 100 meters over that way. So on the mapping side, that's that's where satellites fall for us. And of course, the satellites are connecting us right now. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a perfect answer, and they keep us safe. You know, all of our um, sensing of the ocean certainly like you would not want to go out on. Those were brave people a long time ago who just headed out into the ocean with no idea what they might encounter. Certainly, the the safety and the operational planning that we have now by being able to look at weather patterns and optimizing when we should be where and when we think we can have the ROV safely in and out of the water, since we often leave them in for multiple days on end, 24 hours around the clock. It's um, both for the human safety and the scientific integrity and the, you know, how nice of an experience you're going to have while being at sea. You certainly want to have that forecasting and, and know that kind of data. Awesome. That's so true. Yeah, I, I, I kind of take that for granted. We can be constantly checking weather reports. We have scientists at shore weighing in and saying, hey, I see that you're close to this area. Could you go check out this thing over here? Like it, it, it makes it such a different level of exploration than what was available in the not so distant past. Yeah, I certainly think back to, to my expedition on the, the rare instances that we passed by any small little island and to hear that early explorers somehow found their way to that using nothing but the stars. Like, I mean, I, I looked at that and thought if you, you take a quick nap, you would never even know that you had just passed by it. Um, so it is, it is truly astounding how 
clearly all of this is only possible because of the, the technology we have at our hands. Um, kind of switching gears, actually, um, there are a couple questions about uh, climate change, and, and you know maybe you guys can comment a little bit about any work that you guys are doing in the space or how you've seen it. I know that we, you know, kind of in, in uh, you know, colloquial discourse to talk about it through our lens, right? It's getting hotter, sea level is rising, that affects homes on the coast, these types of conversations. But what about from, from the ocean research point of view, deep sea, far away from, from humankind? Uh, are you seeing effects of climate change? Sure, I'm happy to talk about that. I think there are, it's, it's a two part answer. In one part, I think you would be totally safe to say, like, we need these baselines. We are discovering things for the very first time. And so you need to understand, like, where we are at right now, if you're going to be able to understand how things are changing. And at the same time, to not take anything away from that answer, yes, there are already things that are visible, even in the deep sea. Um, this was not our work, it was a paper that was done off the coast of Chile um, that detected. Uh, rising temperatures even in the deep sea basins there in the subantarctic absolutely incredible work to see that over a time scale um, of only a few decades uh, that paper was very recent i'm happy to share it with anybody who has the questions um, but certainly things that we're seeing in the ocean is some of the changing chemistry the same ocean acidification um, effects that are being seen near shore, the dissolving CO2 in the atmosphere into the water. Certainly the ocean has taken one kind of for the team already. The ocean has absorbed most of the excess heat and a lot of the excess carbon that we've put into the atmosphere. Things that we expect that will change there are things like the productivity and the surface waters. Um, shifting that balance, certainly of temperature or wind-driven currents or storm effects, changes how much food just sort of rains down. We call it marine snow. Um, it's all the dead bits that uh, come from the sunny surface ocean end up making their way to the deep sea. That's a massive carbon sink, but it's also a food chain element for a lot of animals. So expecting different patterns, um, either overall, just it's hard to say there will be more or less, but maybe there will be more in different areas or less. Um, as a result of that marine snow, there is a layer of the ocean called the oxygen minimum zone where bacteria are sitting and digesting and using up the oxygen of that marine snow particles as they come through. We expect there may be some changes in depths in areas of oxygen minimum zone intensity or distribution, like how wide that that layer is. Um, and, you know, I think those are a few of those that have already been identified. Um, certainly things like... Um, ocean acidification, changing the chemistry of how animals that need to create shells or structures like that coral that creates um, a skeleton, uh, changing the chemistry of the water impacts many of the things there. And it's, uh, as all science questions tend to be, it is not a satisfying, like, terrible for all corals, great for all corals. Um, but there's a lot of complexity in how different species that we're just learning about and naming and discovering um, may be impacted. But certainly the deep sea is not exempt. That's what I would say. Um, I guess uh, uh, you got a couple of questions here looking at uh, kind of, the, again, that complexity of, of what's going on in the deep, deep sea. Um, other than, you know, seeing chemosynthesis and these kind of like exciting new um, metabolic kind of pathways, what else makes deep sea creatures just like wild, just makes them unique? Big question, but, uh, uh, you know, a chance to kind of show some of the cool things that you guys have found. Oh my gosh. There's so many things that make them bizarre. I think about like a food chain where everybody is a slow motion scavenger and everybody is a terrible exaggeration. The microbiologist would be like, talk about the microbes. Um, a lot of the diversity that we're understanding in the ocean is in teeny tiny things, but um, I'm trained as a coral reef ecologist first and foremost, so I'm gonna talk about the big things. Um, and there are some just like truly bizarre creatures in the deep sea and who make their living in strange ways. Um, and a lot of those are scavenging. They're living off of things like this marine snow flux or things that just rain down. And yet they're then recycling them and turning them back into this like larger food chain and, and keeping those nutrients kind of moving through the, through the world, which is amazing. Things like um, sea pigs, which are see-through sea cucumbers that walk on little legs. They have a hydrostatic skeleton, which think about just like, putting um, 
filling up a Ziploc bag like halfway with water and then kind of squishing it from one end to the other. And imagine like squishing that water from one little egg to the other and walking across the seafloor, um, you know, eating all the little sand and sediment, uh, all the organic molecules and particles in between the sand and sediment and then passing all that sand right back out. Um, there's things like hagfish, which if you teach younger students, they are an animal um, with a skull but no vertebrae. And um, they're just like, the grossest Halloween creature in the world. And I'm going to let you go to Nautilus Live and search for hagfish if you're not familiar. Uh, so I think there's a lot of intriguing animals that can be the way to open up a lot of other conversations about uh, about life. Erin, do you have a, a favorite animal that has a unique um, way of making a living or, or an interesting story to tell? I, well, I am a geo background, so I, I focus more on the, the rocks um, and don't usually know the names of animals. I really depend on you guys behind me, but I do love sea pigs. I just think they're so funny. <laughs> I, I can't explain why. They're just, everything they do is comical. Uh, an, a very popular one for students, and of course, is, has uh, kind of come up in our, our question list here, is, I, I mean, I know, again, as I was shocked to see... Um, you know, like when we saw vampire squid and uh, when we saw the uh, uh, all, all sorts of just kind of crazy new things. But the one everyone wants to know about is sharks. So yeah. for, for our younger viewers out there, biggest shark you've seen, why do we maybe not see as many uh, in our deep sea expeditions? Uh, what, what are they doing if they're down there that deep? Um, biggest shark I've seen is a seven gill shark that was longer than Hercules. So he was over four meters long. This is a big shark. Um, so, lest we think there are not big sharks, there are big sharks. Um, th this was not, we say deep sea and we mean so many different things. The deep sea is so much of the ocean and it ranges from, uh, a lot of people say the deep sea begins, at, a lot of scientists classify that as 1,000 meters. Some people classify it a little shallower than that. And then we work all the way down to 6,000 meters. So, um, seven gill sharks are on the shallower end of that deep sea range, but in that um, one to 2,000 meters, you can find really big sharks and they're they're scavengers. They're um, finding different animals. They're hunting down there. There are fish. Um, the reason you don't see like giant schools of fish, giant tuna, some of these big things um, are just about the amount of energy in the base of the food web. If you're making your living off of little bits of stuff that are probably being eaten and processed and recycled somewhere as they're falling through the food chain or through the water column before they reach you, um, it's you know, I'm not going to say anything bad about celery, but like the nutritional quality of celery is not exactly the same as if you were like eating something with a lot more protein and a lot more calories. So by the time you get down to the deep sea, um, you find animals that are often sort of in slow motion. They metabolize slowly. They reproduce slowly. Um, they don't have like big beefy bodies. You see a lot of fish with these like long, skinny, elongate bodies without carrying a lot of muscle mass. And if you were to draw a shark, with a long, skinny, elongate body without a lot of muscle mass, you get a seven gill. They're a long, thin animal, kind of a big bulby Muppet head, but um, otherwise a pretty narrow body. But we also see little sharks, we see glow-in-the-dark cat sharks. Check that out if you are interested in sharks. We did see a shark on the last expedition. It was a little bit uh, shallower, probably around 500, 600 meters, um, but it was it was super cool because we were focused on sampling. So everyone was looking in the front of the vehicles. And I looked up to one of the cameras off the starboard side where they were going to put the samples. And there was a shark kind of creeping up on us, checking us out from behind. And if you weren't looking in those cameras, you would never even know that it's there. It's just very sneaky, very cool. And if you like sharks, check out Nautilus Live. And then uh, there's the education tab. And we have all kinds of fun stuff there, but one of the things that I love are the video playlists. And they are all kid approved um, YouTube playlists and there are different themes. So if you just want to check out sharks, check out our Sharks and Rays playlist or our um, Maritime History and Shipwrecks playlist. Or uh, I think there's even like a cute octopus and squid only, only cute uh, cephalopods playlist. Um, but those are some of the great spots just to, to lose yourself in the deep sea. Yeah, you guys even have like highlights by year. So if there, there are things that you wouldn't even know to look for yet. Uh, so, you know, watching some of those highlights, you can just kind of be blown away by some of the wild uh, discoveries that are found and then kind of investigate further from there. Mm -hmm. um, since you mentioned uh, the, the education opportunities, the last question that everyone wants to know about, how the, how the heck do I get involved, right? So I know that obviously COVID made some big changes to 
the educators and students on board. Uh, but can you tell us just a little bit about the opportunities for uh, students and teachers going forward? Absolutely. So um, there are lots of ways to explore along with us um, from the live stream and our social media channels um, to our live event series. So similar to this, we've also had some great conversations with different members of our team, how they got interested in that kind of work. So you can check out those features to dive in and meet some of the different personalities, maybe explore the type of career you might be interested in having um, with our career videos or our BuzzFeed quiz of what job you'd have on Nautilus. Um, also, uh, if you want to join us at C, we run a couple of different types of programs. We have a paid internship program for students um, from community college, undergraduate, graduate school, or recent graduates. So wherever you are in that education journey, we run programs in ocean science to be a data logger on board the ship, in seafloor mapping to work with Aaron and discover um, these features on the seafloor and learn to acquire and process that data. We have an ROV engineering internship if you're interested in um, robotics and engineering like the vehicles, Hercules and Argus. Uh, we have a video engineering and filmmaking internship, um, which if you are interested in how we tell the story or the satellite communications and technology elements of, of how we are doing this work. Um, and we also have a, naval, uh, a navigation internship that's offered in partnership with the Coast Guard Academy and the Naval Academy. Um, happy Veterans Day to folks in the US if you're interested in, in that type of service career. Um, there is also a pathway there. Um, for educators, if you are a formal or informal educator, and that can mean writer, artist, um, teaching anywhere from you know K to gray along the spectrum, and you are interested in helping introduce the deep sea to your audiences, we run a science communication fellowship um, that brings you out to be the expedition communicator. Uh, it's how I got involved in the program for the very first time, and it's how Brandon uh, joined the Corps of Exploration as well. So that's a year-long program where you work as a cohort with other educators from around the world and um, get to go out on expedition for a period of time. So uh, all of the information about those programs is available on our website. Um, we will not be opening applications this fall, but you can check out those next fall for the next season um, coming up ahead. And certainly on the website as well are all of our education resources. So if you're looking for anything from um, Nautilus Bingo, like you're watching the highlight videos and you want to play a little game along the way, or try a design challenge, or bring in a um, national standard aligned uh, lesson for your classroom. Um, all, those are there and searchable by topic or searchable by grade level as well. Yeah, and if you're uh, an educator watching this now, a reminder, uh, Megan and I will be back this weekend. Uh, the registration for that is on the JPL Education website. If you guys want to um, hear more about uh, these opportunities to go through some of the activities from both Nautilus and JPL Education, we'll kind of talk through them, model a couple for you guys so that you guys can uh, take them to your students. Uh, so with that, um, uh, we'll thank this incredible team uh, for this incredible opportunity. Thank you guys so much for this great talk. It really just promotes wonder, truly, uh, to see that that uh, this is something that everyone can do, right? Everyone can access this online. They can get their hands into it. Um, I think it just, it, it really is something that puts a spark in me that for the future of STEM. So thank you guys so much for joining us. I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you, Brandon. And thank you, Erin. Go mapping. Have fun out there. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for sticking with us. Thanks for signing us in. Good talking to you guys. Always. Bye, everyone. Thank you. All right. So to uh, close out in the last few minutes, uh, I'm going to show you guys just a little bit about uh, some of the opportunities for these educational activities uh, at JPL Education. Um, as You'll see on my first slide here, uh, the main place to go, our first stop is jpl.nasa.gov edu. And you'll see at the top, there are several um, kind of categories for you guys to play with. So our internship opportunities, uh, kind of similar to uh, the ones that Nautilus offers, uh, we take hundreds of interns a year. Again, due to COVID, that's uh, kind of been reshaped. But if you have graduating high school students uh, or beyond all the way through graduate school that might be interested in working at JPL, this is where to go. And if you're more in the K-12 scene, then you'll play with this teach and learn section where you're gonna find things like our classroom activities, our at-home projects, and et cetera. Um, on the second slide, you'll see an example of this. Uh, one of the activities I really like for our, our younger audiences 
is uh, what I call precipitation towers. And this is a, a kind of representation of data of rainfall of precipitation for different cities across the world. And we have these sheets already made and young kids get the chance to look at, at you know, is there seasonality? Are some places drier than others? Uh, generally, we don't give people Pasadena or really anywhere in Southern California since uh, they, they finish first. Um, for our older students uh, on slide three, you'll see an activity based off of some other uh, satellite data we have, like graphing sea level rise. Because we have all of this NASA data, um, we, we can pull this. You, we can put this into lessons where kids can, can authentically interact with some of the data that's being collected from these satellites. So this isn't, this isn't hearsay. This isn't uh, uh, you know, just talking about it. They can actually access the real scientific data that we've collected uh, over decades. On slide four, um, you'll see uh, a very a brand new lesson that our uh, uh, awesome team of chemists and geologists put together, thanks to the incredible help of our web designer. Uh, and this is looking at some of the things that you heard mentioned by the, the Nautilus team, which is the, the geology down there is really important too. This kind of often forgotten science uh, that, that doesn't get its fair shake. Um, but now I'm, I'm learning, I'm, I'm a convert myself that, uh, Geology is really just slow chemistry. So that knowing that, all of a sudden, I, I've started to love geology. Uh, so some really cool activities there looking at how uh, our crust is formed, why we have the, the diversity of rock structures that we have, and just kind of a cool way to model uh, uh, some of this geochem. Um, on slide five, you'll see a site that I really hope all of us will, will at least visit once. Uh, again, whether you're in the classroom or not, this is climate.nasa.gov. And this is where all of that data about Earth science is collected in one spot. It's, a, it's just your, your quick go-to for all things climate and uh, all things Earth science. And it, it's really an amazing website. What you can see at the bottom of the, um, of the picture here is what I call like Earth's pulse. So how are we tracking things like carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, temperature, um, sea level rise? And by clicking on any of these, you'll actually get access to just kind of quick um, tidbits of data, and you can deep dive and go further. So really, really great place to start um, for your own personal edification, as well as uh, to have students, again, manipulate data. There's, there's nothing more compelling than uh, actually getting their hands in the data themselves. They shouldn't have to just be talking about credible resources or some unknown scientist says this. They can do this. They, the data is written for them. Uh, and I think it it's becomes that much more impactful. Um, on slide six, you'll see that beyond just these activities, we have uh, just a multitude of other resources for you guys. Um, so we have things like the teachable moments. This is in the news section where, you know, every once in a while we'll write kind of a deep dive, still written for the general audience, but exploring some new feature of, of what's happening at NASA or JPL. This year uh, on the West Coast, things like wildfires were running rampant. Um, so we you know, got together and wrote an article on that. So these are kind of chances to not just get a topical understanding, but really look a little bit deeper uh, in terms of what JPL is doing. Uh, on slide seven, uh, again, you'll see if you uh, really want to take a look at this teach section, this will be what we'll focus on primarily on our uh, educator workshop session this coming weekend. And the thing I really love about this website is the, the fact that you guys can kind of use these drop down menus to get exactly where you wanna go quickly. So of our hundreds of activities, all of which are 5e lesson planned, uh, worksheets are already made, answer keys, we're translating many of them into Spanish. Um, you guys can quickly do a search or pull down a drop down menu, say I just want ones on, on oceanography. I only want ones that are for grade six. And this way you can kind of really get to where you're going as quickly as possible. And then on slide eight, you'll see because of the fact that uh, you know we're in this remote instruction environment, uh, the learn section is a great place for either kids to explore other on their own or to have teachers kind of point students to. And these are lessons that mirror the ones in the teach section, but are written a little bit more for like a student driven exploration. So a little bit more like, uh, you know, step by step uh, uh, kind of 
get the the wheels turning before you put them out into the open to uh, uh, explore on their own. So I think that's uh, really been a um, a, a huge uh, uh, asset for the remote instruction because you can assign this to students and say, show me the final artifacts of your project instead of this kind of traditional, you know, um, teacher led model. Uh, on slide nine, I'll tell you guys that, uh, again, this is only just uh, the tip of the iceberg. There are so many other amazing education uh, resources. If you go to Learning Space, you'll see these kind of groupings of different thematic uh, uh, kind of lessons, uh, activities, things to read, uh, multimedia kind of videos, pictures. We, we put all those collections there for you as, you know, if you know what you're looking for, this is everything we have in that space. And uh, it can be... Uh, a really great way to, to kind of explore a little bit further. So finally on slide 10, I'll tell you guys, uh, you know, again, there, there's just uh, no end to the, the number of, of resources we're putting together. We always are working with teachers to put together uh, more exciting content for you. And uh, I hope you guys will play with these websites and uh, hopefully find something that sparks your scientific interest or the interest of your students and your kids. So with that, I'll, I'll close out for the day. Um, I thank you guys so much for joining. I hope you really enjoyed today's session. And uh, if you want to learn more, um, please check out our websites, as, as you've seen here, or the websites of the uh, Nautilus team, the Ocean Exploration Trust. Really big fan of their education materials, too. And we'll dive a little deeper, cheesy pun very much intended, uh, on some of uh, our collective resources this Saturday uh, for a teachers-only workshop. So. Thank you guys so much. Really appreciate your time. I hope you guys will join us next month uh, for our following session. Have a great night.